The struggle with security is keeping it prioritized. If you're going to build it, build it right, and that includes building it secure. How does my security stack up against everybody else in the industry? What are all the like easy wins, like high security impact with very little effort, very little disruption? Trying to work with engineers when you're not part of the engineering organization is much more difficult. It's much better, if you can, to get a security feature owned by a product manager. If I'm doing something myself, I'm probably doing it wrong, because there's only one of me and there was dozens of engineers. Hi, I'm Guy Pojarni, CEO and co-founder of Sneak. And you're listening to The Secure Developer, a podcast about security for developers, covering security tools and practices you can and should adopt into your development workflow. The Secure Developer is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybeats.com. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you would like to suggest a topic for us to discuss, find us on Twitter at The Secure Dev. So hi, everybody. I'm here with Kyle Randolph from Optimizely, who handles AppSec there, who we've had several conversations in the past, and I'm really happy to have him here on the show to share some of his experience at Optimizely. Kyle, do you want to maybe introduce yourself a little bit, talk about what you do, your history? Yeah. Hey, I'm Kyle. I've been doing security for about 15 years. Citrix, cleaning up the mess at Adobe, uh, building security at Twitter, protecting free speech there, and then now over to Optimizely, where we're building security from scratch at a startup. Oh, very nice. Yeah, that's uh, cleaning up the mess at Adobe was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I guess this was at the time of the uh, Adobe, the, the repeated Adobe PDF Reader uh, vulnerabilities and Flash vulnerabilities? Or Yeah, if you want to get malware on somebody's computer, it was headlines in the news, <laughs> send them a PDF or a Flash file and take control of their computer. Yeah, I guess there's the security aspect and there's the victim of their own success in the sense of having Flash at, what, some 90 high percent of, uh, of yeah. machines everywhere. Yep, yeah. Yeah, there was more computers with Flash at one point than there was Windows machines. Yeah. So you deal with, you say you're at Optimizely, you're building security. What's your, what's your role these days? Yeah, my role is throughout engineering all of our products that we build, ensuring that we have security built into them, making sure both that all the different features we're building are secure, as well as having the right security features in place that enterprise customers would expect in a product that they would use across their organization. Oh, interesting. So you're sort of working closely with the product itself. You don't just deal with with the security of it after the fact or the audits. It's more about building building it in. Yeah. So we we built our program to be tied very closely to engineering. We we sit with engineers, interact with them every day, from design reviews to code reviews, to advising on libraries, design patterns, tools, and automation that they can use. Working very closely with DevOps, in and end from the beginning of an idea to when we ship that out the door all the security that we need to have built in, making sure that it gets built in. Cool. And this is, is it the same team? This is like an AppSec team as opposed to an InfoSec team? or Yeah, we call this an AppSec team because it's within engineering. So we work with uh, the product management and engineering teams to build security in there. We partner with the InfoSec team, which is more focused on protect the company, from t- traditional IT security risks, so making sure like our Wi-Fi is secure, our Active Directory domain controllers are isolated and have good access control. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're, but you're you, you and and your group are are in the development organization. You right. work with yeah. Dev. Cool. Yeah, I've been in organizations both where the security teams inside and outside of engineering and trying to work with engineers when you're not part of the engineering organization is is much more difficult. It's harder to get traction with them, or they, you may not seem as approachable, but being tied into engineering, you know what's being built, you know what's on engineers' minds. It's much easier to gain influence over engineers and also have them come to you. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. How does, uh, just for context, how does the uh, ops side of the fence work in Optimizely? Is that also kind of a part of that same entity? Yeah, there's a DevOps team, we call it E squared or Engineers for Engineers, so building tools and automation to help engineers get their job done easier. And so we partner with this team very closely, for example, with Amazon Web Services. A lot of our infrastructure is deployed there. And uh, E-squared, they want to automate a lot of that so developers don't have to think about how do I get my code into production. And then we want to bake a lot of the security in during that uh, deploy process. So in AWS, you have security groups and VPCs and cloud trail logs and so on. This like dozens of things that we don't want developers to have to think about in order to make their features secure. So we build that into the automation when you're pushing this thing to production, you're also baking all the security into what they're shipping. 
Right. Yeah. It's all about you know one lowering the bar, just sort of making it easy for mm-hmm. you to consume it, and the other is just sort of avoiding avoiding all the specific manual laborious tasks and make it make it just happen. Right. Yeah. You know, it's all about yeah. sort of scale, I guess. Is which is amazing how you know that type of concept has really become natural in the world of quality testing, right? Where QA, mm-hmm. it's not that QA is decreasing really, but you know, in many more startups, like you know, for instance in Sneak, it's not, we don't really have a QA team and there's really no plan for it. The understanding is that you own it and you own the quality, you build tests, you build components and they they grow there. And yet somehow it's a little bit more novel to uh to sort of uh, do that in security. Oh, yeah. that's cool. And so you joined Optimizely you know, when we first chatted, you know, you were still it had sort of a lot to build up, right? You know, you joined in to create kind of this ecosystem. Can you kind of share a little bit about how that how that transpired? You know, what did you see when you came in, and you know, what uh, what did you do to improve it? Yeah, so I joined Optimizely October 2014. So it was a startup. They'd been around for five years, built primarily in Python on Google App Engine, so a large monolithic web app. In Python, so you didn't have to worry about like buffer overflows because it's an interpreted language. And then because it was built on Google App Engine, you got a lot of your security for free because mm-hmm. Google was taking all the taking care of all the security lower in the stack, and, and they know what they're doing. Yeah, that helped Optimizely get along for a very long time with without a formal security program in place. And then the developers were security savvy and had the right idea for how to build some security in based on reading like OWASP, being familiar with OWASP top 10 and common vulnerabilities. As this monolithic application grew and they got more customers and larger enterprise customers, the security requests from the customers began to grow. So asking for two-factor authentication, single sign-on, audit trail, and so on. And the security Um, features, right? Not just uh, just guarantees, but straight up security features. And then the the security risks started to become more sophisticated as the product gained traction. So now on a lot of the largest websites in the world, the most popular ones, they have Optimizely on them. So as an attacker, before a little startup, you may not have even noticed it, but now you're like, hey, I could compromise all these sites at once. Mm-hmm. If I compromise optimizely, that raises the stakes, and that's where more advanced security was needed to be baked in. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, today, optimizely, you know, has its scripts on all so many pages, right? Mm-hmm. So you can, you know, get a lot of access to data, and you can actually manipulate the content. Mm-hmm. No, I guess optimizely modifies that content intentionally, yeah. right, as as its core being to sort of optimize. The, the site's performance, so mm-hmm. you know, it feels like a, a rich target. I'm sure you have your hands full. Yeah. So I guess what was like there was no formal program. There were a bunch of the developers doing the uh, the OSP thing. You know, how did you approach it? Right. How do what did you do first? Yeah. So this this was interesting coming into a, a company like I would say the engineering team. They there was no security engineer there ever, but uh, the engineers wanted to do the right thing. They just wanted to know what what is the right thing to do. And there's thousands of security things they could do, but what are the most important ones they should be doing first? And uh, as the security engineer coming in wanted to make sure I built up a good relationship with engineering and didn't just like bog them down with tons of security requirements and keep them from building new innovative features. So some things I wanted to do from the start are like find. What are all the like easy wins to begin with? Let's find all the like low hanging fruit that'll give us like high security impact with very little effort and very little disruption to engineers. Building out a backlog of those, just going around talking to engineers, buying them beers, buying them coffee, whatever's needed to talk about like what's on their mind. Not even saying anything that they should be doing for like the first like month to six weeks, but just listening and uh, everybody brings security issues and concerns to you, mm-hmm. and uh, you, you discuss them, but without like you know, don't make them defensive and tell them what they did right or wrong or whatever. But just like you collect a lot of information that way, and then from there you can start building out your plan, and you know where the hot spots are that you need to focus on or put some process around or, or build some defenses in. Yeah, and I guess it comes back to the fact that everybody wants to be secure, mm-hmm. and it's more about dealing with. You know, either the lack of expertise or just sort of the time crunch, right? The fact that, you know, if you've invested a whole chunk of time in making something more secure, oftentimes that's invisible. That's just not seen by anybody. And yet, the fact that you have not built this feature, or this functionality, that's painfully visible. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of hard, I guess. And to an extent, you can be there. Uh, you know, for the things that they want to do, you can be their their excuse, their support person, and also their expert, right? To sort of say, well, is that really worth doing or not worth doing? Yeah, yeah, 
that's where uh, what what should you do first? Like security vulnerability, like severity ratings, those, those help somewhat. But what helps more is like telling compelling stories of like, hey, like here's a, here's a real world example of when this vulnerability led to a company actually being compromised. Like uh, something very similar to Optimizely, a company called Gigya. They also load JavaScript on a lot of different uh, mm-hmm. companies' websites. And so what happened to Gigya is uh, the Syrian Electronic Army said, hey, let's compromise Gigya, compromise their JavaScript on all these different sites, Forbes, all these different sites, all at the same time said, you've been hacked by Syrian Electronic Army. That was a great way to like drive home, like what is a what would an optimized security vulnerability look like in the real world? And you know, we don't want that to happen, so here's yeah. the things we need to do to prevent that. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a good good example of it, and I guess as close an example as you can get to the actual business kind of makes people relate to this could happen to us. Mm-hmm. So those were those were some of the tools that you used to be able to educate or sort of promote. Maybe like you give them these real world example. I guess you also used the so these conversations both to build relationships, which you know at the end, at the end of the day it's all about people, right? Mm-hmm. But also to to understand and kind of get the the lay of the land. You know, what did you do? Like at some point, you do need to start tackling those, right? You've identified your priorities, you understand them. You know, you're kind of buddies with the different people, so they would kind of trust your judgment and listen to you. What are the sort of the first steps that you introduced that are still kind of process oriented or, or tooling oriented? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, kind of a guiding principle was if I'm doing something myself, I'm probably doing it wrong because there's only one of me and there was dozens of engineers. Mm-hmm. So, it's all about enabling engineers to be able to do these things. So, setting up many different things at once. So, showing off tools at lunch and learns like, hey, look at this really cool security tool that can help us find cross site scripting. And uh, just like show it off, show how cool it is, show a success story, and then like kind of cross your fingers that at least one engineer in there will think it's so cool that they'll go run it themselves. And so that's kind of like fishing, not pH fishing, but just fishing for people <laughs> who are interested. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's a good way to get like interest, getting a security group put together. We call it the security cabal at Optimizely. This is like any engineer interest in security. We meet Mm. each week, just talk about like scary security stuff or cool security tools. We also have a Slack room where we we just talk about these things daily. And just by having a constant uh, conversation there, a lot of engineers will like pick up something, like play around with it for the afternoon and, and start trying these things. That helps a lot. Sorry, these are just the like people that are interested in security Naturally, it's not their yeah. job. You know, yeah. they're engineers, and they just, you know, alongside their day job, that just is one of their one of their passions. Yeah, yeah. And it, in the early days, like there were so many things that needed to be done for security. It was like, okay, we have this. Let's say we have a hundred things to do. We have twenty things we know we need to do now. Like, let's put those twenty out there and see how many people are interested in. And chances are, if they're interested in and passionate about it, they're gonna. Be much more productive working on it than if it's assigned to them. So mm-hmm. let's get those out of the way first. Other ones kind of kept on the shelf and like waited until like let's say there was a quality improvement that needed to be done. We are going to split this feature out into a microservice. That's a pretty good time to add in some security that we had sitting on the sidelines that we knew needed to be done. Or another quarter we had an initiative to speed up the delivery of our CDNs, and that's a great time to. Say, hey, now it's time to look at like TLS optimizations, for example, and let's clean up the insecure cipher suites that we have in TLS. Uh, so satisfy the security guy, making it secure, but then also we get some speed out of it when we start turning on TLS optimization. Right. Yeah. Basically, sort of bundle it in as a, I guess maybe as a natural aspect of quality mm-hmm. for for those components, and just yeah. just make it be around. If you're going to build it, build it right, and that includes building it secure. Mm-hmm. How did you how did you find out? Like as you say, you know, you're sort of you know one to many mm-hmm. uh, in terms of number of people. So absolutely awesome. I think that you're not a gate. I'm a firm believer that mm-hmm. you know it's just it would never scale. It has to be built in and it has to be kind of spread out between the people, you know, in, in kind of this continuous fashion. You also you can stop any process uh, and have them be done manually. But you still need to know, like you need to know that a microservice is being built, you need to you know, maybe advise a little bit about what are the opportunities. Did those end up just permeating to you because relationships? I mean, how does that work? Yeah, that one is a challenge. So, like, how do you scale up with the organization? And uh, in like classic like waterfall times, you go through this big requirements phase. You see all the requirements in one PRD document, and you could just mark the ones that that you have concerns about. Now, in like more agile development, like 
everybody's building on their own schedule. They may or may not use like Kanban or Agile or whatever. Uh, there's no one place where you can find everything. So with that, you I found like you just have to spread yourself everywhere that the engineers are to, to have a lot of ears. So hanging out in Slack rooms where you know the action is, watching email lists, joining teams' email lists, going to their meetings, going to their special interest groups, speaking every week about security and in different meetings where you know engineers are going to be. Just make yourself as available as possible. And then you have a lot of engineers coming to you, which is great, especially after they see you're going to help them and not and not slow them down. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, also having your ears open in all the places that you need so that you get wind of things. Sooner or later, you'll find out about them one way or another. It may not be like in the design phase, but you want to find out about them as soon as possible. A great place to kind of find out about things is source code. And so in our code review tool, setting up rules like if anybody touches these files, like opening up a new route in our monolithic web app, then we know that's something, that's like a new feature. And so that's something that is a good place to flag for a security yeah, review. So you've got little spies there, right? You're right. Not, yeah. not, not, uh, not people spies, but you know, mm-hmm. just sort of sensors, I guess, kind of spread out to, to tell you when yeah. something interesting might be happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, know, you do this, and I, you know, I think it's awesome. And again, kind of believe in, in the approach of you know, permitting it, making it a natural part of the culture. I've seen a lot of that success also in performance, in web mm-hmm. performance, because I've been kind of oscillating from web security to web performance. I see a lot of that. Also, notion of like you don't want to be a performance janitor. You know, you want to mm-hmm. to sort of permeate that and make it a natural part of your of your company. And security needs to be the same. A lot of the conversations we had there was about celebrating successes, which is always tricky in security because mm-hmm. you know not getting hacked is not sufficient because you know hopefully that's the normal course of operation. Otherwise, you've got other problems. Did you consider that? I mean, are there ways in which you somehow? Sort of celebrate either an investment or a success in security. Yeah. Uh, so the company has different ways to recognize success, and we kind of tap all those for security and, and make up some of our own as well. So company wide, there's a way to like one employee to thank another employee for something, and so, and that's very public and recognized each week at the company all hands meeting. So using those thanks to thank people who've even just fixed one security bug. Anything mm-hmm. with security, or they had a good security question to give them thanks there. Stepping that up a bit more, like in like quarterly retrospectives, what went well, what didn't go well. Security guy, you could always just say, well, security wasn't as good as it could have been, but mm-hmm. <laughs> more pragmatically, talking about like who did do awesome security. Like this team is great. Like they fixed all the security bugs they said they would, or everything they made this quarter, they had a design review before before they built it. And so we knew security was baked in at, at that very early phase. Going further than that, like giving out T-shirts. So, like we actually give out T-shirts that say "Security <laughs> Hero" on them. This is more exclusive, so it makes people want to step it up and like really go above and beyond to make a security contribution. Like maybe you eliminated cross-site scripting, you built it into the framework your team uses. Then that that would warrant a Security Hero T-shirt, and then you yeah. get recognized in front of the whole company. Nice. That one you need a slightly higher bar because right, yeah. if you start giving them up too much, then you actually lose the uh, yeah the yeah. the prestige yeah. of having that shirt. Yeah. So yeah. So many different tiers of of reward there and recognition. I guess are there uh, specific examples of uh, well, you gave a little bit, you know, with the cross-site scripting framework or with uh, with sort of the team that that is fixing this, but you know, do you have I know a specific story that you feel kind of manifest really really demonstrates how this succeeded? You know, converts or, or the yeah. like. Cross site scripting and cross site request forgery. In both of those cases, like we had an engineer who like they may have like had a bug or two assigned, and they they're like, I've seen this before. I don't want to see this again. And so they just went out of their way to really say, here's how we're going to fix this like comprehensively. And in one case, like this one team with cross-site scripting, they didn't even like talk to me. They were just like within their own team. The guy made a presentation like, "Here's why cross-site scripting is bad. Here's how we're going to make sure our team never has it anymore." And then they're like, "By the way, we did this. <laughs> We've been cross-site scripting, and that that was awesome. To not even have to get involved, they just took it upon themselves to to do it. That's even better than like roping the security guy in to tell you what to do, but to decide on your own to do it." Yeah, that's great. That's a, like definitely reaping the the fruits of of your labor, right? You, know, mm-hmm. you sort of planted those seeds, and you know, they grow inside. How um so this is all like process and and people and how do you celebrate them? Are there specific tools that that I know you'd sort of throw out that you find especially useful? 
Yeah, we've been focused in AWS, like how do we get our heads around that? And it's not so much security tools that help there, but like uh, just latching on to the automation that's going in there. So DevOps team and engineering teams, they want to manage just like their networks and VPCs through cloud formation, but hey, you could also like manage security groups in there by bundling like Coinbase made a nice tool called Demeter, which manages their security groups, nice and simple. We're using a lot of Spinnaker for our deploy automation, which is not a security tool, but that's just the place that like you can bundle in all the other like security configuration that you want to have happen. Uh, so th- those have done very well for us. The uh, third-party libraries, like we know, we need to address that, and uh, SNCC looks very promising. So like looking forward to trying that one out. That's that's crazy to think like uh, how much third-party code we have, and and we don't know what's going on. You know, if we don't have a tool that can actually do all that analysis, I remember being at Twitter and wondering, like, how's this monolithic Ruby on Rails app pulling in code from all over the web, at Twitter scale, not not have some kind of compromise? And it's really <laughs> well, scary to think. Yeah, know. yeah. So that that's looking very interesting. And then uh, we have a web app security scanning tool, but I've never found one that works. I'd love to know about <laughs> one there. Yeah, I've. Uh, I've uh, so. I've, I've built two, uh, and yeah. I can point out many, many flaws in either yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, so those are those are the tools now. Definitely looking more to, to automation and open sourcing things as we go. Cool. So I guess uh, you know on the um, I don't know if it's it's dark side or like the necessary evil. You know, in security, it's good and well that and and in fact, kind of what you need to do to sort of permeate and build it, let it come organically. Sometimes you do have kind of hard lines, right? We talked a little bit about PCI just before this started and you know, you do have some other regulations, there are security questionnaires, these sort of joyful mm-hmm. hundreds and hundreds of uh, of questions and, and diagrams that you need to provide. How do you, those get handled? Yeah, with those it's kind of like customer stories so like that's kind of putting on your product manager hat and like telling these stories very frequently. You have to, it's Unfortunately, you have to repeat yourself very, very often. But you're being this like security feature evangelist and like reminding people constantly, like these are our customers want PCI, and then PCI wants to preserve the integrity of our JavaScript, and then we need X, Y, and Z to preserve the integrity of JavaScript. Like that's our contract with the customer. So tie it all back to that, or it could be like ISO or something else, data privacy in Europe, like. Tying it back to a story and then just telling that customer story over and over that keeps it in in people's heads on like why why they need to do that. I guess when you come to think about it, that's indeed oftentimes how you promote how you manage to to get a a customer story around a feature or a need mm-hmm. or a capability comes in. So as well, this is a core necessity. I imagine those do eventually get captured by more the product managers and mm-hmm. put in into a prioritized backlog or yeah. Typically, it's security feeding them into the product management backlog, and then once they're accepted in there, then then you have a. It's much better if you can to get a security feature owned by a product manager, and then they can. That's their specialty, and they're very good at seeing those things actually get built and built properly with the right documentation, marketing, whatever you need, so that you can focus on doing the engineering side of things. Cool. So I guess you know, stepping out of Optimizely for a moment, you know, you sort of have. This experience across different companies, right? You've been sort of big and small, and I guess mm-hmm. different phases. Do you feel like these techniques that you have in Optimizely? You know, how many of those are? This is just the way you would have approached it, almost regardless of company, uh, versus things that you think you know you, you need something there to be able to apply this. You know, how how broadly applicable are they? Yeah, uh, with this one, I like to look at the uh, BSIM, the building security and maturity model. This is where uh, Sigital did interviews with over a hundred software companies and asked them just like, what are all the things you do to build secure software? And it was across different industries, types of companies, and so on. And uh, the interesting thing there is a lot of the activities are common across different types of software companies. It could be an insurance company, it could be a SaaS company. They may do them in different ways or for different reasons. Like it's not like one size fits all, but Across different domains of security, I believe they have like 12. Uh, there are very common activities, about 120 of them. So, like some of them make sense for Optimizely, others don't. Some of them make sense for Microsoft, others don't. 
but that's a, a good place to start and use it kind of as a measuring stick. Like, how does my security stack up against uh, everybody else in the industry? It's always an endless set of tasks that you could invest in it. So, yeah. you know, how do you know that you're doing sufficiently well? Mm-hmm. I guess, you know, that's a, that's a million dollar question. Yeah. You know, I guess sort of within this, do you have a favorite? This is all kind of broad and this, you know, I've kind of asked for the anecdote as well, but, you know, what's your, what's your pet peeve? What's the thing that you find kind of you really, really either like that people do or you really get annoyed <laughs> when people do not do <laughs> and kind of surfaces? Is there one? Yeah, I, I guess the uh, struggle with security is like keeping it on, keeping it prioritized. And, and a lot of times people want to do the right thing, but then when you get to a resource crunch, it features often went out. A thing to be careful with here that uh, been a struggle throughout my career is just getting teams to commit to building things like we agree this is a security issue that needs to be addressed. But uh, when the horizon goes out more than like a sprint, like okay, then it's like it'll be done next sprint, next sprint. Next <laughs> thing you know, you're a quarter out, and and it's something ha- has fallen off the radar, even a year out. And uh, with this one, I found it is. Unfortunately, very proportional to like how much energy the security team puts into evangelizing those things and pushing for them. So you have to be very selective and identify those at-risk things that may not get done and save your energy and your political capital for those to really drive them through. Yeah, I guess the it's focus, 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 right? Mm-hmm. It's all about sort of choosing the things that you want to handle well versus handling eh, mm-hmm. sort of a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, yeah. So it, this was super fascinating, and I, you know, I've got a whole million uh, questions to ask, but I think we're going to run out of time a little bit. But we, before we part, you know, just as a as a word of advice, I try to sort of ask this of all the guests. You know, what do you, if you talk to a development team right now looking to up their game in terms of security, you know, what's your sort of one area that you would advise them to do, or you know, sort of one thing that you would advise them to uh, start with? I think that uh, getting all of your security issues out in the open, like discussing them, like a lot of teams will say, like, oh, yeah, we've known about that, or I heard there was a security bug over there, but you don't even see them in their bug tracking system. Like, can I even go see, like, what are all the security concerns that we have? Not even having that transparency about, like, what your security exposure is or what, it, what you would like it to be. Without that information, you don't even know how to do the right thing. So I think getting all the concerns on the table, like, what, what do we expect our security to be and what are the known problems that keep us from being there? That That's a good way to bootstrap on like what is the security that you need to do and at what priority. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It's like get your head out of the sand, right? It's mm-hmm. much more convenient to just not think about these things right. and hope for the best. And just mm-hmm. forget about it. You know, we see this a lot with third party security, right? It's, you know, you use them, it works. You'd rather just not really open up that. Pandora's mm-hmm. box, yeah. Um, but yeah. Otherwise, if you once you start surfacing it, I guess you'd be more motivated to actually uh, start making a dent in that list and mm-hmm. improve them. Yeah. Cool. Well, this was fascinating. Thanks a lot, Kyle, for uh, for coming over. And uh, yeah, looking forward to to chatting some more. Great. Thanks a lot. That's all we have time for today. If you'd like to come on as a guest on this show or want us to cover a specific topic, find us on Twitter at the Secure Dev. To learn more about Heavybeat, browse to heavybeat.com. You can find this podcast and many other great ones, as well as over 100 videos about building developer tooling companies, given by top experts in the field, 